to cheat or not to cheat? That is the question. Whether well, it's nobler to fudge a roll and suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to die, to cheat no more. It's cheating on WebDM. I got a 20. This episode is sponsored by Monty Cook Games and their Tallest Kickstarter. Now, Tallest was a massive and ambitious third edition product that is Monty Cook's setting where the third edition designers uh, got to play in the city by the spire. It's my white whale of RPG products. Tallest is a fantasy city like no other. Find adventure in the vibrant streets, down the dangerous depths, and up the magical spire. Every copy of the mighty 672-page tome came with dozens of physical handouts, aids, and props, in addition to nearly 300 pages of digital extras. Tallis is coming back for 5e and Cypher System fans. MCG is issuing a Kickstarter to reissue this deluxe product in two versions, one for each of these critically acclaimed game systems. Link here and in the description. All right, Jim. Yes. First off, let's let's uh, this this subject we have today is going to be very. Oh God. It's going to be a it's going to be sure. a doozy. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's going to going to raise some hackles, ruffle yes. some feathers. Yeah. But yeah. first and foremost, what is Fiat? <laughs> what is DM Fiat other than a floundering car automaker? <laughs> like, I mean, sales haven't been good in the U.S. So. Yes. But, but still, keep, keeping up with it, especially in the context of like how, how far, you know how much power does the DM have? Yeah. How much uh, you know what counts as DM cheating? Can they even cheat? Fiat is a term and a concept that's that's useful to kind of keep in mind. It really is like a very fancy term for the DM is empowered to make decisions mm -hmm. to help facilitate and run the game. Some people might call it rule zero, which is you can change anything about the game you don't like. It's the heart and essence. Yeah. of role-playing games, which is that these are not hard and fast like rule books where the RPG police are going to come by and make sure that you're in compliance with the rules. You've got the latest errata and all that stuff. The Federal it's, Bureau of Rules Lawyers. Right. Yeah, it's, they're guidelines. They're suggestions. They, yeah. are, uh, they are there to facilitate your enjoyment of this game. And, and I do think that over, over the course of the hobby, as, as obviously as you know, money became involved in the commercialization of the hobby and the like, that aspect of do it yourself, make it up yourself, uh, has been lessened a little uh, and and diminished in response to sort of like you know playing raw or by the rules or things like that. But the essence of the game has always been that, that the DM it bears the lion's share of the burden for sort of making the game sing, making it run well and the like. And they have a lot of tools at their disposable uh, disposable, <laughs> a lot of tools at their disposal uh, to do that. And one of them is just the ability to say, nope, this is how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And I, that is a blunt instrument. It's a it's something the, the, the because I said so. <laughs> the because I said so. It does, all, it, does it does have that image of a parent, right? With, with oh god, when standing start, over you, going you know. Yeah, when, th there are a lot of things in just in the general topic of, of can the DM cheat, and especially as we get into like the particulars, that does start to look a lot like parentalism. Like the DM, I know better. I yeah. I'm I am, and and it's easy to fall into that trap, right? You've got more knowledge than the players. You have a better clear, you know, a better understanding of how the whole thing kind of fits together, what the enemy's plans are, how the world works. And so it's easy to then go, I know what's best for this. Yeah. And that's really where I jump off this train. <laughs> and until then, I'm all on board. Yep, DM should be empowered to make decisions to run the game. The DM can just say, make it so, you know, but I see that less as a authoritarian sort of controlling power that the DM has and is more a function of them being judge and referee. Yeah. And really for me, the, the DM as judge and referee is a good metaphor. I, I like that much better than storyteller or whatever that you sometimes see. You're an impartial and fair arbitrator of this experience. Mm -hmm. And there are times, for the most part, that the DM's going to be, you know, they're going to enter into the game in the guise of a monster or an NPC or something. And, and in those situations, following the rules as much as possible is, is a good idea. But a lot of the times the DM is not really in the game. The DM is outside of it. The players are playing and the DM's answering questions, offering guidance, clarifying, uh, you know, helping them adjudicate uh, 
yeah. you know, rules, you know, questions of mechanics, the game rules and the like. But yeah, it should be yeah. the player's game, though. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Right? The, the heart of D&D <laughs> is, and the heart of role-playing is, yeah, the players are making decisions. They drive the game. The, the DM responds. They set the stage. They have a considerable degree of influence over the course of the game. So, like, in the moment where the game is actually happening and the, and the players are at the, player, are at the table uh, making decisions, reacting, responding, pursuing their goals, to then start changing up a bunch of stuff and altering things behind the screen and, like, not responding to the players, but, like, trying to outmaneuver them and massage the game in a certain direction. To me, that's when I feel we're starting to get into the cheating territory. They're starting to do to edge the toe the line. It's like, right. Mm, you, you, I don't, I'm not going to say like, never do these things. And, and, and we're going to talk about a lot in the video. And yeah. while we're still here within the first five minutes or so, let it be clear. We are not saying never do this. We are not saying always do something. This is comes with a big heaping helping of in our experience. Your mileage may vary that kind of thing. All the standard disclaimers. Uh, yes, most definitely. And, but, and side yeah. effects that can ensue. And certainly in side effects yeah. that you'd want to see your practical, real-world doctor about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in case you somehow are here yeah. looking for help with that kind of thing. Yes, if uh, DM fudging is causing incontinence, that's, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> DM fudging is causing player incontinence. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, okay, but on the subject of fudging, yeah, yeah. you know, as we learned a lot from Richard Nixon, if the DM does it, is it cheating? <laughs> is it cheating? <laughs> <laughs> like, can the DM cheat? Yeah. Is it possible? for them to cheat and I think like the fact that we're even framing this as cheating and not cheating tells us a lot because yeah. the truth of the matter is is no they can't in a traditional RPG the DM is empowered to make whatever changes they need to to make the game work there's the rule zero fallacy that says the game should still be well designed and just because a DM can change things doesn't mean the game designer has to you know has to give up on their job or whatever I'm not caring about all that stuff. I care much more about um, perceptions and, and the experience of individual tables. And because we're in the business, literally, of giving RPG advice, of adding some nuance to this conversation. Can the DM cheat? Uh, I, I don't think it's a good idea to. Um, yeah. But I think it's worthwhile to sort of like look at it because a lot of things that would be considered DM cheating are, like I said, very powerful tools for your toolbox. They might be things like altering monster HP on the fly, changing the parameters of an adventure or an encounter or, or something after you've already kind of set it up in response to something that's happening at the table. Uh, it could be that you, you know, an NPC was going to do something, you know, you're like, oh, this is how they'll respond if this happens. But then in the moment of play, you decide to do something different. And because to me, like, the actual play is the most important part of the game, you can prep and plan for a lot of things, but you might not know what's going to happen. You might not be able to predict what happens. Something more satisfying might come along. Yeah, your players can often surprise you. They very much can, and that's part of the fun of being a DM, because otherwise there's not a lot of surprises. You kind of know, uh, you know so much more that uh, opening yourself up to being surprised by the players is a very satisfying thing. There are some things about cheating as a DM or, or what might be perceived as cheating that I consider off limits. Mm -hmm. And those are anything that negates player agency. And I, this is a fuzzy area and, and players have different uh, conceptions of what constitutes agency for themselves. I'm talking about things like uh, offering the players a choice that has no real choice, like a false choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you could go left down this path or right down this path, uh, and regardless, it's going to lead to the same outcome. Yeah. Those are the kinds of situations, and we've talked about them in other videos, uh, yeah, where the illusionism, the illusionism uh, mm -hmm. presenting a false choice, that kind of thing, uh, sometimes known as the quantum ogre, uh, yeah. <laughs> which uh, just Google quantum ogre and and uh, and, and Schrodinger's ogre, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and, and sort of sort it out. I fall very much in the case of if you are running a game in which you are giving the players information to make informed choices, then you are really are not running the kind of game in which you can switch things up behind the screen. Well, or you should, like you were saying. I mean, if you, what's the point of giving them a choice if they're always going to fight that ogre? Like, right, just yes. have the ogre attack. Them. Just have them, yeah. Then uh, yes, and and let them know, well, you know, that that they don't necessarily have a choice in that matter. And mm -hmm. and I think that's it. There's a lot of these sorts of, of of either misuse of DM tools or or stepping over the line that does proceed from a place where the DM goes. 
goes, I know what's better. And furthermore, the players aren't going to find out. Yeah. And I think that that partially comes from a place of the fact that as a DM, you are constantly lying and hiding information <laughs> from the players. It, it, it's just the nature uh, yeah. of the game. But sometimes that deception is in service to the game as you're going to play it. Nice catch. Thank you. So we man at arms is lost. Uh, and <laughs> uh, sometimes you're doing that not to facilitate the game as it's meant to be run. Like, for instance, you might not uh, reveal what the evil wizard's prepared spells are because that's just not information the players, uh, their characters would have access to and it makes for a much, yeah. much less satisfying encounter. But have you ever like added a spell to their prepared spell list mid-combat? That's the kind of, that's the sort of thing that I find a gray fuzzy line. And I personally don't because I don't want players doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, I prepared this one spell, especially in... Uh, versions of D and D where you you know if you want to cast fireball multiple times you have to prepare multiple fireballs something yeah, like that, yeah, you know? yeah erase that <laughs> ace right quick <laughs> right. since you haven't uh, cast that nobody saw it right. times two <laughs> times two yeah yeah um, and it's the it, it's it's little things like that where you know are you going to add a special attack or defense to a monster because a player strategy is just becoming a little bit too effective mm -hmm. are you going to you know throw yet another wave of monsters in there. Uh, um, you know, because, you know, you wanted the fight to be something else. And, and yeah. you know, those are questions that we can't answer for you. <laughs> we mostly just want to let you know that, like, players usually have very strong opinions on these kinds of things. And their perspective, their opinion are not often factored in. If you go online and you read about, you know, should DM fudge or what kind of fudging guidelines are there? What kind of cheating guidelines are there? Is this cheating? Is this not? Should I do this? It's it, the first thing to ask is really like, what do your players think? You know, how do they feel about you changing these things mm -hmm. on the fly? What yeah. do they think about this, uh, this? And their opinions are as all over the map as DM opinions are. So like, why would you think you know what they want or what would be better? That's sort of where I, that's like my, that's my litmus test for well, it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's uh, humans are, are no, are, are, they are known for thinking they know what is best for other people. Oh, sure, right, right. right I right. mean, that's just that's the that's the problem that most people have. Is, yeah, is the breakdown in communication like that? So, is it not just better to be open about it up front? I think so, right? Like, I think that because one of the costs of uh, of per perceptions of DM cheating, so much the core of the RPG experience is trust and communication. I, I don't think it's all of it, right? Like, there's all kinds of reasons people play, all sorts of things people want out of the game. But if you don't trust your dungeon master that, uh, you know, to run the rules fairly. The rules that you presumably have all agreed to play by. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that rarely, rarely often gets discussed in these kinds of discussions about cheating or fudging or whatever, is that, well, you know, if you guys all agreed to play by these rules and then one participant just arbitrarily decides they don't have to, that doesn't seem like a good situation, <laughs> you know? Not at all. Uh, so, um, you know, like if trust and, 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 and having, having everyone sort of, well, I'm just gonna say it again, having everybody trust each other to uh, play fairly is such an important thing because when that breaks down is when all sorts of bad behaviors crop up and, uh, and it's where you get those experiences where people are like, yeah, I, I'm never gonna play D&D again. Or I played with that one DM where like, no matter what I did, they always passed their saves against my spells. Or I, you know, I, you know, I just couldn't, you know, no matter what we did, it didn't seem like we could ever make progress except in the area that the DM wanted us to make progress in. Mm -hmm. That's I you know I just don't know many people that find those uh, find those kinds of game experiences satisfying, you know. Oh no, I've, I've definitely I've been there. Like when you're a wizard and you cast your fifth spell of a combat. Oh yep, they said they passed again. Like yeah, is is it like really? Are you sure? Because that shouldn't happen. You know, like yeah, it, it, like it, it, well, it, it and could, also I suppose, yeah, yeah, it, it could happen. I mean, hell, you can get on a hot hot streak and just roll. <laughs> but like, I guess my question is like, is that a situation? Maybe one of those edge cases where maybe hey, on that fifth time, no, they failed. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I might do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like that, and now we're talking about like specific sort of techniques of it, and, and really the heart of this is fudging dice, right? There's so much of this that comes down to well, is I, the outcome of the randomizer what you 
you know, acceptable or not, you know. <laughs> right, right. I mean, everything else, the, the story that's been presented is one thing, and the player's actions in response to that and their, and what they plan on doing is one thing. Yeah. I mean, they can just have a, they can just have a dumb strategy to yes. attack your big bad. But if they come up with something perfect, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden all their die rolls just don't support their course of action. Yeah, Like, yeah. are we now getting into those territories where... I think there's a lot of pressure. I, yeah. I certainly think you are getting into territory where DMs clearly feel pressure to deliver a certain kind of experience, to ensure a certain kind of experience, and yeah. to to massage the events of the game so that it stays within certain parameters. And again, I'll say, if that is what everybody at the table wants, then more power to you, and I hope you can get something out of this video. But what I find, and I know this is true for myself as a player, and, and you know, if you start asking a lot of players, is they don't necessarily want that. That they might be playing to see what happens. Uh, they, they might be playing to you know, let the dice fall where they may, or uh, you know, to, to certainly not like, have one person's vision of the game be the one that carries the day. Like, there's very, it seems like there's very few people who are like, yeah, I, I'm just here to listen to this other person tell me their story. And occasionally I'll, I'll offer my input. At, at the very least, those who are very much focused on the story of a game are, they seem to want to participate as well. <laughs> And want, yeah, to have a little, a, want yeah. to have a bit more agency. So. Yeah, a little bit more than just the choose your own adventure, it, right. this or that, <laughs> yeah, turn yeah. to page 62. Right, like what the choices that you make are the moment-to-moment -moment tactical decisions, but your impact on the game is perhaps, uh, you know, next to nothing when it comes to the overall course. Like, yeah, you chose to attack this monster or use this ability or that spell, but the fact that you're in a fight, the fact that you're in this location in combat, that necessarily wasn't your choice. And, you know, the techniques of railroading and the reasons for why, and, and player agency are very complicated things, and a lot of them involve feeling, a feeling of agency, a feeling of having control over your character's decisions in, in the game. And to me, it's that feeling part of it that um, I know it's, it's hard to nail down, it's hard mm -hmm. to exactly say what it is that, you know, are you respecting player agency or, or not? But if... Um, if a player finds out that you are altering things behind the screen and they are, are already sort of feeling like, well, I don't know that, you know, am, am, is anything I do matter? <laughs> like, do, you know, is it, it, it uh, any choices that I make, they all seem to lead to the same place. And then if it looks like you're fudging, then it can just get to a situation where the players are totally checked out. And, yeah. uh, and I think it's the costs of, of altering things, especially die rolls, because dice have such a, a, an important place in the RPG hobby mm -hmm. um, that it's worth at least thinking about and, and, uh, and asking yourself some tough questions when you're in those moments. Yeah. Know? Well, I mean, it could be also a thing where are you asking for too many die rolls? Yes. Like, I mean, like, when do you need a die roll, right? Right. That is a big one, though, for real. Because it's, you know, how many times have you been playing and you realize, like, the DM calls for a knowledge check or a perception roll, and you just clack, clack, clack. I rolled up a two, and I got, no, I got, like, a seven. Oh, never mind. Never mind. I'll give you this information anyway. And and, and so those are low stakes kind of fudging. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if that was to happen in combat, you would be like, oh, you rolled a seven on your attack? Right, go ahead and roll damage anyway. You know? Yeah. And I, it's when it's participation damage, <laughs> participation damage, damage on a miss is a hot button issue in that situation. As the DM, think about it for a minute. I, I think that we as dungeon masters, we're, we, we feel a lot of pressure and there's a lot of anxiety around the game, especially if you're a new dungeon master or, or you just like want a certain kind of experience for the players. And, you know, you either you're not thinking about why you are calling upon a certain rule or mechanic. Uh, or you're just sort of like, you know, going by habit. A lot of DMs just get into the habit of calling for uh, an ability check or skill roll or something. But really ask yourself before you call for a die roll, is this necessary? Uh, if, if I am, am I willing as the dungeon master to accept the player utterly failing this thing? Yeah. And if the answer to that is no, then change the stakes of the roll. Change the parameter of the role, change the context of the role. All of that is within your purview and is perfectly fine. And the more you root it in the fiction of the game world, the less of a dissonance there will be. Yeah. Uh, you know, some things you, you know, you can retcon a TPK by saying, I made a mistake on that. We're going to go back five minutes 
of game time and everybody Ooh. restore your characters back. And that's, ha I, that's happened to me as a, as a player uh, when I was part of a TPK and the rest of the group was really discouraged. You could tell the DM was like, I did not expect this. Yeah. And I was over here going like, all right, guys, come on, we just make new characters and some of us survive. Come on, we can keep going. And the DM looked at, at their actions. It was just like, no, I've made a huge mistake and let's back it up and we'll, we'll pick it up from here. And, you know, instead of my character being riddled with manticore uh, barbs as a mind flayer, you know, melts their brain, I now have a stuffed mind flayer in my character's mansion. You know, we, it, it, it ended up from TPK to total victory because yeah. of, of just decisions we each made and die rolls and things. So it can happen, but it was rooted in the game world. All of our characters knew something happened in that room. We should have died. Yeah, but we didn't, and and so they they know it was an event yeah. that happened. The grace, the grace from a deity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Something you know, yeah. our our guardian angels literally reached down <laughs> into hell and pulled you back <laughs> right. out. But I'll tell you what, that mind flare is such a conversation starter at parties. <laughs> yes, I'm really proud of that one. But he's the reason why I couldn't afford a fourth level spell book. Uh, so well, <laughs> I spent all the my trophies gold. will be there forever. <laughs> the spells you'll get to them eventually. Right. I think to me the fun Fudging part, dice fudging, changing. Mm -hmm. I find it a really fascinating topic. It's all because it's one that people seem very much willing to die on their hill for. Well, you know? yeah, not just because of the wordplay. Um, <laughs> so, what are 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 there limits that we can explore then? Oh, certainly to yeah, yeah. to the die die fudging. I think in terms of limits, it's important to sort of know what exactly it is that we're talking about here. And I don't I don't think that dice that fudging dice is not something you do during prep. You know, there's a lot of randomizers in, in traditional role-playing games that are purely for the dungeon master. You know, to the players, it really doesn't matter what the weather is or how you arrived at that decision, whether you rolled on a random table or you have a die that has a symbol for the weather or you just picked it. For the most part, players aren't probably going to care. Uh, and similarly, a lot of players can't tell the difference between a completely random encounter and one that you planned. And a skilled DM who has, you know, good skill at uh, description and transitioning from moment to moment can really make it seem as though randomly introduced elements were planned all along and present a sort of unified front to the players and really aids in immersion and, uh, and the like. But the DM is under no obligation to stick with any of those outcomes. Those are not game mechanics that are resolving an action they're just there to inspire you, to help you. They're, they're, they're aids. The one exception to this would be if it's like, you know, you have a specific wandering monster table for a specific location that you specifically created, then I do kind of think like, you, you, if you choose to roll on that table, then maybe keep it because that table is there to represent something from the game world. Yeah. You know, uh, but that's, again, a corner case uh, in that situation. And in every case, you're choosing when to roll the dice and when not to, so. Um, you know, always keep that in mind. Ignoring things during prep, or uh, or you know something that comes up in in game that you're rolling on a random chart for, and you look at it and you just go, "That's weird," or in, you know, it just doesn't fit with what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about. And and I'm also not really talking about um, you know not necessarily what we mentioned earlier, like making changes to the monster stats or things like that. I don't necessarily consider that specifically fudging. Even if it's you know adjacent, yeah, yeah. Really, I'm talking about when you roll the dice, when you have decided to rely upon a game mechanic or a system or something from your game in order to resolve an action, and you do not like the outcome, or or for whatever reason the outcome is not uh, what what you want, mm -hmm. of using your ability as the DM to just say nope, nope, and nope. changing that somehow. And that's a, like I said, this is a really contentious thing, right? Like DMs yeah. are very divided on, on dice fudging. Yeah, I mean, to your, to your previous point about uh, during prep, like my last uh, campaign that I ran Breath of the Fall, like I had some very extensive nested 3D6 tables. Sure, yeah. And when I would be rolling, because I wanted to roll randomly for everything that was uh, going to happen like yeah. as they traveled down, yeah. like I would do my set of rolls. I'd be like, all right, I'll do three rolls on this, two rolls on this, one roll on this and then see what it gives me yeah. and see how I can make that into a coherent 
yes. uh, narrative, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but sometimes like I would roll things and I'm like, this is all doesn't disparate, make doesn't make yeah. any sense. And I'd roll again, and then guess what? Sometimes sense. I'd roll like the same thing that we did last, oh, cannibals again? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, everybody's hungry, but are we that hungry? <laughs> um, but but it, it is a way to kind of craft a story. Yeah. But I, I do agree, like once, once players start making decisions, um, it's kind of hard to change a die roll just to, to even if it's in service of their decision. Sure, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then, like, wh- like, are you just gonna build the road for them? And, right, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah, there, there are a lot of slippery slopes when it comes to like dice fudging. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think that there are some legitimate uses of, of, of the tool, that there are some times where it's appropriate for the DM and the players to say, yep, this is what was rolled, but we're gonna change that. Uh, I think that the, the ability to do that should be rooted in the game system. So mm-hmm. if you take a look at something like Numenera, Numenera has GM intrusions and player intrusions and the ability to just say, no, I don't wanna roll this die at all and spend uh, the resources that you have to not you know, have to do that. And then the fact that the GM never rolls yeah. and they are all, they're introducing things through a different mechanic, like that's all baked into the rules and therefore the game supports it yeah. and encourages it and it's not intrusive it's just a, a style it's uh, it's and, just the name of it it's yeah just... <laughs> right, you know and so but a lot of these things especially if we're talking about more traditional role playing games there's not necessarily rules that support this mm-hmm. uh, unless there's like you know in the introduction a rule zero clause or something yeah and so the arbitrariness of it the the fact that that it doesn't seem like there are a lot of hard and fast guidelines and therefore it's so often one person making a decision to change something under the assumption that they're making the game better yeah, or, yeah. or something like that, or avoiding an outcome that they, uh, that's undesirable. That's where, I, again, I've come back to it. I was like, isn't that a little arrogant of you guys? <laughs> like, isn't it just well, a little bit? <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Enough here, to make you think first, yeah, yeah. surely. Well, you know, in that, in that regard, not to, not to put you on the spot here, Jim, but yeah. uh, we're spicing this up. Let's do it. Here's a case, and let's look at it. Our Planescape game, okay. back in the day, I'm playing Abaddon. Okay, yeah. The tiefling. Yeah. Dual wielding. Mm-hmm. We're fighting, I forgot, we forgot what kind of demon or devil we were fighting. Yeah, yeah. But he was chunking lightning bolts around. Oh, and yeah, you yeah. hit me square in the chest and rolled almost like max damage. Ooh, yeah, and I'll yeah. never forget when you were like, oof. How many hit points do yeah, you yeah, have? Yeah. Do you, I remember you said, how many hit points do you have? And I yeah. was like, you mean like right now? They're like, no, 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 just max. Just max. <laughs> because it was second edition, <laughs> and it was like, if you yeah, if you I reach their, their hit point, man, you're just dead. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I mean, like, I mean, point, you were gonna hit me with like, I forgot how many hit points it was, and, but I just remember you going, you're at negative one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can I can recall moments like that, and 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 like my case, like so. I'll, I'll just go ahead and state my my where my lines are for this. Yeah. As we get into reasons why people fudge and uh, and all that stuff, is my my the times when I consider it okay for me to fudge are um, when the real life people at my table, the consequences for following through this game action will affect the relationships with the real life people. And either that's because of pacing, we all gotta go to work tomorrow, and, and, and if we keep this up, uh, this, you know, we're gonna be here another 45 minutes, and we gotta yeah. wrap this up, we gotta, okay. Um, you know, that, that com- we used to speed clear dungeons, to a door, clack, 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 open the door, here we go, fight the thing, fight, fight, fight. But that's one, you know, you're in a big fight, and it's getting, you know, you should have ended the game 30 minutes ago, and you're just ready to be done. Yeah. is a case where I might uh, say, have the, the opposition uh, fail a morale check. You know, I might have them, um, you know, just have less H- HP than they might have. I will always try to signal those things. So I might say something like, man, you guys, you know, you've been fighting these orcs a long time. They seem tired out. AKA, they might have less hit points than they had a minute ago. Yeah. You know, or they seem like they're on the point of breaking. And then it'll be, okay, the next one that drops will trigger the rest of them to flee. Something like that. I, for me, it's very much about if I'm going to make these kinds of decisions to justify it in game somehow. Yeah. Um, it's a fantastic uh, fantasy game. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, so that's the other one, pacing and, and real life concerns. The other one is just, is a friend of mine at the table having a shitty, shitty day? Are they just, you know, did they just have a terrible, terrible time? Then I might not... 
crit on them multiple times in a row. I might, I might yeah. just decide that, yeah, okay, the, you know, the, it's just not going to happen. Or, uh, or it'll be a case of, uh, and this is an actual one where I, I did within the last uh, year or so, where we're playing a game uh, in Lame Between Two Rivers, and it's 10th level. And uh, the, our, the druid of the party, uh, my brother's druid, uh, Baloo, died to a finger of death. And so it wasn't just a, um, a regular death. They had already been attacked by a slod and had failed their save against the Chaos Phage mm -hmm. that, uh, that slod can pass on. And then a warlock cast finger of death at them. And it did more damage than they had HP, so they death by massive damage. There's a bit of contention in a moment, a bit like how exactly did Baloo die? Right? Like, is this a death by massive damage? Are we using the rule right? Uh, cleric in the party was, was sort of like, nope, this does not have to happen. I'm a 10th level cleric. I can take care of this. We have the player of the druid going like, nope, my, my guy's dead. I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was a clean kill. I was surprised. My very next action, I got done with my warlock. We have our discussion. Everybody, okay, everybody good? We're ready to move on? All right, my assassin attacks the bard and crits. And I just I was like, after dealing with one character death, I just said, you know what? They just don't crit. They're still an assassin. They've still got the sneak attack. They've still got the poison. I still managed to bring that character to three hit points, signaling that there's still tension and threat in the fight. That's an example of a corner case in which I'll look at that and I go, the, it seems to me, reading the table, that the emotions were running high, that real tensions were possible, and in this moment, maybe ignoring this and just downgrading a crit to a regular hit is going to not make things worse. And that's yeah. literally the only time that has happened to me <laughs> in yeah. all of my role playing experience. Like, like, that's the only example I can think of. Well, of yeah, when but I've done something like that. But something know? like that, you probably avoided precipitating a full TPK. It's certainly, right? yeah. I, I mean, I, I can see that, yeah. And in, in that sense, I think. The way the fight was going at that time, it wouldn't have been a TPK. There still would have been, uh, the rest of the party was still pretty healthy and up, mm -hmm. and most of the enemies had been defeated by then. Um, but I don't usually uh, do things to avoid TPKs, mostly because I try not to run games where a TPK means the end of the game. Yeah. You know, a TPK just means the end of this, these characters, but not necessarily because it's D&D &D and we can always come back or you can go to the underworld and get their soul or something yeah, like that. You got to hire a new, uh, got to hire new adventures anyway. Or <laughs> right. maybe everybody got a fob, <laughs> right. you know, yes. to be contemporary. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, the third one and final one is, uh, and the one I will do most frequently is, have I not hit anything in the last 10 rolls as the DM? Yeah, I'm going to hit you. And that, that is a case of, <laughs> yeah. I, I might. And, and, and usually those are the ones where I feel the, the, the most sort of like, oh, I should have done that. And they're usually, they're very impulsive decisions mm -hmm. for me. The, they're usually ones where I'm like, oh, screw this, I'm going to get you. And I know when I start making those kinds of decisions that emotionally I have reached a place in DMing where I'm letting myself get frustrated by something that is inconsequential. The fact that I have missed the last 10 times with my die rolls yeah. is the consequence of rolling dice. Yeah, and you, while I might be frustrated with that, I shouldn't let that frustration get the better of me because that is how I will lead to decisions that snowball into railroading and oh, yeah. player agency and all kinds of things. Yeah, because while D&D &D isn't a competition, there is, um, there is a competitiveness or Certainly, I guess a, a contention between the, the player and the DM so that can easily lead into that natural human, sure. like I want to do good also yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I had a, I had a similar thing to your to your die roll thing that happened in, in my uh, Star Bound game where I was just hitting really good one yeah. night. And then finally one of the bad guys who had like three attacks went all after the monk and he had an increased crit range and I rolled a 20 and two 19s. Right. And I was just like, <laughs> I've already been like kind of kicking their ass. And so I was just like, you know what? He still crits. Yeah. Just those 19s aren't crits this round. Yeah, and I will say this. I am such a hypocrite because from, if I'm a player in that own campaign, I'll be like, do not change any of those, DM. You, you rolled a 20 and two 19s against me. No, DM, you well, critted on me with an assassin. But, you know, but like, they didn't see it because we were rolling real dice in real life, yeah, unlike, yeah. say, roll 20. Sure, sure. Which, sure. I mean, I don't know. Do we want to I mean, talk that was, on that well, and how for, that kind of changes? This, <laughs> this is the thing that got me thinking about this the most, is I do a lot more online gaming now and a lot more gaming with roll 20, and I noticed that a lot of my fellow players, no names, but this is it's pretty, it, 
pretty universal. Oh yeah, I've noticed it it's, too. It's not you know not any one person, but it's sort of like people complaining about the randomizers and and you know R in Jesus on <laughs> on roll twenty R in Jesus <laughs> and and it's just sort of like wait a minute. I like this should be a, a like a fairly a, a fair random number generator and these are the roles and does that mean every time you complain about this that you would have attempted to fudge like as a player you know in a real life game where we're rolling dice in front of people and yeah. it, it made me start really thinking about the role that dice have and how people perceive them and why they roll them I mean I know why game wise but um you know for the for players uh, in this sense it was more players than DMs but you know, talking about fudging. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just kind of one of those things where, you know, is there a substantial difference between people that play using virtual tabletops in which everybody can see the role and there's not really any way to fudge it um, versus those who are playing in real life and there's a lot of incomplete information, a lot of opportunities to go like, oh, that wasn't a 13, that was an 18, or, you know, things like that, which touches on the fact that a lot of times I fudge by mistake. <laughs> You yeah. know, I'll just misread a die, declare a roll, and, you know, maybe next round or during the next person's turn, realize, like, oops, I made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, I, I don't usually correct those because I think, you know, I'm, we're just going to keep going forward. But is it functionally any different from the player's perspective? If, you know, anyway. <laughs> Incidental fudging. <laughs> Incidental fudging. So, <laughs> I, you know, we're going to sit here for a bit and talk about fud some more fudging, though, I think, because there are costs to it, right? Like, yeah, even, well, you know, even if we're not going into reason, every reason why someone would. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, you have to ask yourself, like, how committed are you to fair play and being the arbiter if, if and when this thing can kind of take over? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not so, maybe not necessarily take over, but, but it is. It is a especially if you're doing the like. I, I, I think it's not a bad idea to call it taking over because especially if you're rolling behind a screen, mm -hmm. the players aren't there. And it's totally possible to roll in the open and fudge. Like, don't even let, don't even trip that you think that rolling in the open is protecting you from fudging. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. The, that's that, that's just where you change the modifier <laughs> change the in modifier. your head, right? And they yeah. see like that number and they're like, oh, and like, oh, yep. just missed. Yep, exactly. Well, uh, you rolled a fourteen and they missed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's the thing. I, we'll go off on a huge tangent here. That's the thing is most of the time players know. Like DMs like to think that they don't, uh, that they're getting away with something, that their poker face is really good. And most of the time they're not. They know. I, I, I The DMs that I play with and you, you just you tell. It's a hesitation in the voice, a wrinkle of the brow. It's, it's something, if it's not mm -hmm. like a facial uh, expression or, or sort of nonverbal cues, it, for me, it's just sort of um, an, an exhaustive knowledge of the rule books that's just kind of like that's not that that's not that monsters to hit modifier. You know, it's like I can't help it. I don't announce it. I'm not making decisions on that information in sort of the metagaming sense. But it's like I know, I yeah. now know. Um, especially if it's like, wait a minute, that this monster really outclasses us. Why have we survived so far? Why isn't it mopping the floor with us? Those are these moments where uh, even if they're not fudging. If I, if I know that they usually fudge, the doubt creeps in. Mm -hmm. And I think to me that's the number one cost for fudging is that it will erode trust between a significant number of players in their DM. Maybe not all of them. Some players like for the DM to fudge dice. You know, they just do. They, they expect it. But for a lot of players, it seems as though the knowledge that their DM's fudging really starts to get to them. It undermines their confidence in the DM's ability to run the game. It undermines their confidence in the outcome of the decisions that they make. It makes them wonder, is it even worthwhile to do or make any kind of decision? Should we just go with what it seems like the DM wants us to do? Yeah. Are, and, are your players, if they find out you fudge, are they all of a sudden starting to buy you gifts or bring you bring extra snacks on. because they know? <laughs> no, well, because at that point, like, well, if it's at their whim, like, got to make them happy. Yes, right. Yeah, that that's sort of the extreme kind of uh, case of it that I'm. But I do think that that's that's what a lot of people are worried about when when they're like, no, I don't want to play with a DM that fudges because eventually you're, it, it's more about playing to them as a person and keeping their sense of what's a satisfying game in mind as opposed to just playing the game without worrying about what the DM thinks you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Because you know that the DM is there as an impartial judge and referee and is going to uh, portray the world faithfully and consistently. 
then you have a greater degree of agency. You can make uh, decisions. And to me, that ties into like another one of the costs of fudging is that what if your players never experience legitimate defeat by a monster, especially if you're fudging in their favor, Yeah, um, which a lot of DMs do because they think that they should or it makes for a better story. What lies underneath a lot of DMs' uh, reasons for fudging is a fear. It's fear of the players not enjoying themselves, mm -hmm. the fear of, of losing your players, the fear of, of someone being upset by an outcome of a die roll. And, and I think if, if the DMs who are really honest with themselves, they, they are worried about their players losing, which to me kind of betrays a lot about it because I thought for a hot second that there were no winners and losers in D&D &D or other RPGs. Is that true? Is I that true, Jim? I don't think so. I think there are winners and losers. I think it's possible to win a game of D&D. &D. I think it's possible to lose a game of D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible to play the game wrong. Uh, yeah. You know, and I think that we're starting to get to the cases where you're talking about like fudging outcomes and changing things, especially if you're doing it without telling them. If it's just something you just decide to do, then to me, we've crossed the line from a fun, enjoyable uh, group experience of an RPG into we're playing the game wrong. You know, that we just are yeah. at this point. Um, and if die rolls uh, and their outcomes are something we're going to ignore, then why didn't we talk about that beforehand? Why aren't we more honest about when we're changing things and why we're changing things? And um, in that honesty, getting more input over when things get changed, because I know for a fact, <laughs> and this is my personal experience, that every time a DM has been like, well, I think this makes for a better story, in my mind, I go like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't want to be an ass, but it doesn't. <laughs> it, you know, part of the reason why we have randomizers is to be surprised and to have things that, uh, you know, that we didn't expect. It helps build tension. It helps uh, create sort of a rhythm of play because we don't always know mm -hmm. what the outcome is going to be. Sometimes we'll succeed. Sometimes we'll fail. We've got to react to those situations. And if you're just going like, well, I think this should be the case, we should win now, or this should happen, or whatever, um, almost every case, my opinion is, I, I would have rather had that been random. Oh, uh, and, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, is in life, a lot of times, to get to where you need to go, you have to fail a lot. Sure, Usually, yeah. if you're trying anything worthwhile, and anything that actually pushes your own personal, like, yeah not only just narrative, but abilities forward. Mm -hmm, if you're mm -hmm. not actually trying something difficult, um, then what are you doing? Then what are you doing? Yeah, and, and it's sort of like if, uh, I think that failure can be a fun thing in a game. It can be very satisfying, either because, you know, this is the thing that my character has to deal with uh, as they're pursuing their goals, mm -hmm. or for me as a player, as I'm learning a game. And, and I think this is another one of the costs, is if you are fudging die rolls without the players knowing, then you're giving them a false impression of how the game goes. And if they yeah. leave your group and go to another group and start playing, and it's a completely different style, and no one's really talking about how their style is different from something else, then you've given them a false impression of what the game is and can be. And um, you don't know how necessarily how they want to interact with the game. They might be looking to take this up as a lifelong hobby. They just absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, but they don't realize that what they love is this particular style that, that you've created for them and they go play somebody else and now there's problems, conflicts, mm -hmm. and you know, this game sucks, it's stupid, I don't win as much. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or... I'm, just, I'm just trying to imagine like Empire Strikes Back with the DM fudging. Right, yeah. Well, I yeah, mean, yeah. it is the most popular Star Wars for a reason. Because <laughs> everybody loses everybody and the bad guys loses. wins. Yeah, they win. But think about that. Yeah, yeah. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Who are... Mm. 
I don't know what that noise is. Uh, no. <laughs> was that a microwave? <laughs> it so it sounded like the, uh, the, the login <laughs> noise for a modem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, like, am, I, am I 13 years old and queuing up some pics before I go to bed? Right. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs>